Just to remind you, ladies and gentlemen, that John Kirby and his orchestra, a really fine jazz band, will highlight today's America in Swing broadcast, the festival feature at 4 this afternoon. Here is music in the jazz idiom, music of a high order that every listener will enjoy. We invite you to listen in at 4 o'clock. Each Saturday at this time, your city station, cooperating with the City College Civilian Defense Council, presents a talk on the broad subject of the role of science in the war. Eminent authorities discuss the contributions of chemistry, biology, physics, and engineering to the victory that democracy must win. Now, today, for the second broadcast in our series, our program guest is Mr. A. X. Smith of the Department of Chemical Engineering at City College, who will speak on nylon and the war effort. Mr. Smith. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. From olden times, silk has been prized as the fabric of luxury, the raiment of royalty. As early as the middle of the 17th century, scientists had already begun to dream of making, by synthetic means, a fiber which, have the, which would have the properties of silk. Today, that dream has become a reality. A reality that is playing an important part in our war effort. In a previous lecture, we discussed the chemist's discovery that all textile materials are composed of molecules which are in the shape of very long, flexible chains. Indeed, since then, he has established the cardinal principle that if any substance, natural or synthetic, is to be spinnable into fibers and threads, it is essential that it be composed of these long, chain-like molecules. <coughs> Further, he has learned how to build such chain molecules synthetically, and by this means has produced the man-made fabric known to us as rayon, selenite, vignon, and nylon. The first commercial successes in this direction came in the early years of the 20th century with the production of the several kinds of rayons. These rayons possess many of the outward properties of silk. They are contributing a great deal to our material welfare by making available silk-like cloth and garments at prices considerably below that of silk itself. However, on the basis of chemical constitution, the rayons differ radically from silk. They are made from chain-type molecules of cellulose, obtained from trees or the cotton plant or other members of the vegetable kingdom. Silk, on the other hand, is a protein from the animal kingdom. The delicate silkworm, which can thrive only in special climates, spins it into a long thread from a body secretion, informing its cocoon. Due to this wide discrepancy in chemical constitution, there are limits to the degree with which rayons can be made to resemble silk. For example, they have not as yet proven to be truly satisfactory substitutes for the silk required by our armed forces. In warfare, silk is needed for the powder bags for large caliber guns and for the manufacture of parachutes. Let us consider what this means to us. The United States produces no raw silk whatever. It is therefore on our list of strategic materials. The production of raw silk is confined almost entirely to three countries. Japan produces 70%, China 20 and Italy 10%. Of the three, Japan and Italy will naturally not supply us, while war-torn China cannot supply us. Does this mean that we are facing an acute problem? Does it mean that when our present stores of silk are used up, the war effort will be crippled? The answer, fortunately, is no. It was left to Wallace H. Carruthers, one of the leading American chemists of our generation, to save us from this dilemma. About 10 years ago, he and his co-workers discovered how to make a new kind of chain molecule in the chemical laboratory. 
It is called a polyamide. Chemically, it resembles the protein and is therefore much closer in composition to silk than any of the man-made textile molecules that preceded it. A long uphill struggle involving a great deal of research and invention was required to translate this laboratory discovery into practical results. But in 1940, the new synthetic material appeared on the market under the trade name of nylon. A product of American research, it was an immediate commercial success. American women have already had first-hand experience with this new material in the form of stocking. Many of them actually prefer nylon to silk, and for good reason. In several important respects, nylon is superior to silk. For example, it is stronger, more elastic, dries faster after washing, and is completely mildew-proof. Warfare agencies have had a similar experience. They find that nylon makes parachutes, which are, if anything, better than those manufactured by silk. We previously mentioned 1940 as the date when nylon first appeared on the consumer market. Just in time from the standpoint of the war effort, our problem of silk supply for war needs is partially solved. Certainly, it is not acute. There are stockpiles of silk on hand, and excellent parachutes can be made from nylon. However, there is still cause to be careful with silk. We must not waste what we have. It is still the best material from, for making powder bags for large caliber guns. When the gun is fired, the powder bag must burn rapidly, completely, and cleanly. No other textile burns and flashes the way silk does, although some types of rayon are fairly satisfactory in this respect. Luckily, good powder bags can be made from waste silk. Public-spirited women can therefore contribute to the war effort by saving outworn silk articles against a future day of possible need. Care should be taken not to mix rayon or nylon with this silk. Turning now to another side of the question, every woman is naturally interested in what the future may hold with regard to that especially important item, her stocking. Indeed, recent advices from usually reliable sources indicate that this is a matter of concern to our armed forces as well. The cause of the fashionably encased leg as a means of maintaining morale in the ranks of an embattled nation may be eloquently and admirably pleaded. But seriously, what should a woman do about stockings, and what may she expect of the future? In normal times, women's stockings are the largest single outlet for silk. There will undoubtedly be a shortage of silk for non-defense purposes. In fact, it is already here. The most selfish and unpatriotic thing a woman can do under the circumstances is to attempt to hoard a store of hosiery. The best things she can do from a constructive standpoint are the following. First, buy stockings only as needed and in normal amounts. Second, take particularly good care of them. Third, try nylon or rayon stockings for the new types of silk of Lyle hose that have come on the market during the last few years. This Lyle hosiery is distinctly superior to that of a decade ago, remarkable in wearing properties, and excellent in appearance. <coughs> to the woman who will act patriotically in this situation, and this means, after all, acting rationally and unselfishly, there is this to say. The capacity of our nylon plants is being increased as rapidly as possible. The day will come in the not too far distant future when we shall not have to depend at all upon the silk run. Most of the world's silk runs may be Japanese nationals working for the forces of darkness. But we have American chemical and technological genius working for us.
But nylon is not the only synthetic fiber of merit. There are the rayons, with which we are all familiar because of the comparatively long time over which they have been available as articles of commerce. There are also two newcomers of outstanding interest, which we shall consider briefly. One is vignon. Vignon is water repellent and dries with unusual rapidity. It is completely mildew proof and will not burn. Up to the present, it has been used mainly for making felts, industrial filter cloth, shower curtains, umbrella fabrics, and the like. But it also has possibilities as a stocking material. Although still in the experimental stage, full-fashioned women's hose of excellent appearance and wearing properties have been made from it. The other new synthetic fabric is fiberglass. The characteristics of glass in its more common forms are well known to us all. Among them are strength, durability, cleanliness, insulating properties, both thermal and electrical, and brittleness. When glass is spun into fibers about 15 times as fine as a human hair, it retains all of the before-mentioned characteristics except brittleness. In place of the brittleness, there is pliability and resiliency. These fine fibers are woven into cloth, which is used extensively in the electrical industry as insulation for electric motors, generators, and so on. But the fabrics may also be woven into brocades, satins, and damasks of exceeding beauty. These new products are already being used for drapes, bedspreads, and tablecloths, gowns, and even hats and neckties. Besides great beauty and other desirable features, the glass fabrics are durable, colorfast, and shrink-proof. You have heard part of the story of the synthetic fibers, but as yet we have neglected to mention the raw materials from which the chemist makes them. The list is fantastic enough, including, as it does, wood, glass, limestone, coal, water, and air. In all ways, the story is as romantic as the tale of Cinderella and the glass slipper. And more wonderful because it is true. The fairy princess does not wave a magic wand to make beautiful, useful fabrics out of thin air. It is the chemist and the engineer wielding the stern yardsticks of cold reason and hard work. Thank you very much, Doctor. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. A.X. Smith of the Department of Chemical Engineering in City College has discussed this morning nylon and the war ethic, one of the weekly broadcasts concerned with the broad subject, the role of science in the war. These programs are brought to you by your city station in cooperation with the City College Civilian Defense Council. And during broadcasts in the public service series, eminent authorities will discuss contributions of chemistry, biology, physics, and engineering to the victory of the past democracy must win. This is the Municipal Broadcasting System.